Earlier this year, author and pastor Brandon Robertson came out with a TikTok video claiming that Jesus was a racist. And here it is. Did you know that there's a part of the Gospel of Mark where Jesus uses a racial slur? In Mark chapter 7, there's the account of the Seraphonician woman, a woman who is Syrian and Greek, both of which there were strong biases against within the Jewish community. And she comes to ask Jesus to heal her daughter who's possessed by a demon. And what is Jesus' response? He says, it's not good for me to give the children's food, meaning the children of Israel's food, to dogs. He calls her a dog. What's amazing about this account is that the woman doesn't back down. She speaks truth to power. She confronts Jesus and says, well, you can think that about me, but even dogs deserve the crumbs from the table. Her boldness and bravery to speak truth to power actually changes Jesus' mind. Jesus repents of his racism and extends healing to this woman's daughter. I love this story because it's a reminder that Jesus is human. He had prejudices and bias, and when confronted with it, he was willing to do his work. And this woman was willing to stand up and speak truth. Brandon is arguing that Jesus was a racist, and that when he called the Gentile woman a dog, he was using a racial slur. Jesus repents of his racism in response to this woman who speaks truth to power, meaning she puts the Jewish Jesus in his place. In a YouTube video he made later, Brandon clarifies that Jesus inherited his racism from the Jewish community. This is what he says. There is this idea of a kind of corporate repentance, repenting for the sins of my people. And I kind of see it as Jesus, obviously, as you said, being a product of a racist culture and is in this moment learning and repenting for what he's inherited. As I will argue, it's not just that Brandon is misinterpreting Mark 7 verse 24 through 30. He's asserting that Jesus and the Jewish community he was a part of was racist. These types of interpretations fuel anti-Semitism, something that has increased intensely over the years and the last few weeks in particular. To be clear, I'm not claiming that Brandon is anti-Semitic. What I'm saying is that applying an incorrect biblical portrayal of the Jewish people to Jews today has commonly been used to justify modern anti-Semitism. This is why interpreting the Bible correctly is so crucial. Once we more carefully interpret the biblical text at hand and analyze Jewish-Gentile relations in first century Rome, we find accusations of corporate racism are dramatically incorrect. I didn't anticipate making a video like this, but when I saw how Brandon's highly viewed TikTok fuels anti-Semitism, I just had to respond. So let's get into this. Mark 7 verse 24 through 30 reads, And from there Jesus arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way, the demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Notice the woman does not challenge Jesus as Brandon wants us to think. She responds to Jesus by affirming his lordship and accepts that at this time, Jesus' priority is to minister to Israel, the Jewish people. And I'll unpack this more later. When Jesus calls her a dog, he's not using a racial slur. Rather, Jesus is using animal imagery, as other Jewish authors do, to emphasize how significant it would be to heal this Gentile woman's daughter. Let me explain by examining Mark 7 verse 24 through 30 in its Jewish context. First, let's look at a Jewish author who describes Gentiles as animals. In Acts 10 verse 11 through 16, Luke writes, Peter saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Many, though not all, Christians take this passage to mean that God is telling Peter to give up the Jewish dietary laws. I'll have a future video addressing this interpretation, but in short, 
what's happening here is Peter's vision occurs in the context of the acceptance of the gospel by Cornelius, a Roman centurion. In verse 17, Peter is bewildered what to make of the vision, which means that Peter did not take the vision to mean the kosher laws were abolished. He knew it meant something deeper. Later, we learn the interpretation of this symbolic vision. In Acts 10 verse 28, Peter says, God has shown me that I should not call any one profane or unclean. The vision is about the cleansing and incorporation of Gentiles into the Jesus-following community. The unkosher animals represent Gentiles. And Brandon agrees that the animals in the vision represent Gentiles. And for me, kind of the biblical story that is at the heart of the gospel of inclusion comes down to Acts chapter 10. And it's Peter's vision of seeing unclean animals on a sheet and God telling Peter that these unclean animals he was to rise up, kill, and eat. Peter argues with God three times back and forth saying, I can't do that because I'm faithful to what the scripture teaches. And the Levitical law says I can't touch these unclean animals. Peter then realizes that this vision wasn't about unclean animals at all, but about unclean people, the Gentiles. So if you think about it, if Jesus was racist for calling the woman a dog, then God is racist for calling Gentiles four-footed animals, reptiles, and birds in Acts 10 verse 12. And considering God is moral perfection, I don't think he's being racist here. I agree with Brandon that in Peter's vision, the unkosher animals represent Gentiles, and this is crucial. Through the vision, God shows Peter that he is doing something radical. God is purifying Gentiles who accept the message that Jesus is the Messiah. In Acts 10, verse 44 through 45 and verse 48, this is what it says. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus the Messiah. In Acts 11, Peter tells Jewish followers of Jesus his vision, how he went to meet with a group of Gentiles, and how they entered the Jesus-following community without becoming Jews. As New Testament scholar Dr. Isaac Oliver explains, Luke claims that Jewish followers in Jerusalem rejoice, not because of Peter's first taste of bacon, but because God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. I love that. For more on Acts 10 through 11, check out pages 390 through 441 of Isaac Oliver's dissertation, Torah Praxis After 70 CE, reading Matthew and Luke Acts as Jewish texts. I'll link it in the description below. The Tanakh also uses animal imagery to talk about Jewish people. In Jeremiah 50 verse 6, God says, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. In Psalm 79 verse 13, the psalmist says to God, As for us, your nation and the sheep of your pasture, we shall thank you forever. For generation after generation, we shall relate your praise. In Isaiah 11 verse 6, Isaiah prophesies concerning the peace in the Messianic age. The text reads, The wolf will live with the sheep, and the leopard will lie down with the kid. While many commentators take Isaiah to be describing actual wolves, sheep, and leopards, the Jewish philosopher Maimonides writes this, The poetical description of Isaiah, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, is a metaphor signifying that Israel will dwell in safety among the malicious of other nations, which are likened to wolves and leopards. For it is said, a wolf of the evening shall spoil them, a leopard shall watch over their cities. Jeremiah 5 verse 6. Given Isaiah 11 verse 6 is a prophecy describing peace in the Messianic age, I think Maimonides' interpretation of the wolf represents Gentiles and the sheep represent Israel is a plausible reading. Like the Tanakh, Jesus calls Jewish people sheep. In Matthew's account of the story, Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Brandon Robertson says Jesus was being racist to the Gentile woman because he called her a dog. But because he calls Jews sheep, is he also being racist towards Jews? No, after all, Jesus is a Jew. It's important to remember not to import modern-day metaphorical insults on a culture 2,000 years ago on the other side of the world. In a Second Temple Jewish text called the Animal Apocalypse, which is preserved in 1 Enoch 85-90, through the author describes Israel as sheep and the Gentile nations as various animals, including dogs. For example, in 90 verse 4 it says, 
And I looked until those sheep were devoured by the dogs and by the eagles. In 90 verse 29, the author continues using animal imagery and describes the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple for the Jewish sheep. The text reads, And I looked until the Lord of the sheep brought a new house, larger and higher than the first one. And those sheep were all white, and their wool thick and pure, and all those which had been destroyed and scattered, and all the wild animals and all the birds of heaven gathered together in that house. And the Lord of the sheep rejoiced very much, because they were all good, and had returned to his house. And I looked until all their species were transformed, and they all became white bulls. And the Lord of the sheep rejoiced over them and over all the bulls. I think this is fascinating. The author of 1 Enoch uses animal imagery to describe Jews and Gentiles, and like Luke's narration of Peter's vision in Acts 10, this author uses animal imagery to indicate that Gentiles remain Gentiles even as God purifies them. New Testament scholar Dr. Matthew Thiessen comments, What is fascinating about the animal apocalypse, though, is that even as it emphasizes the genealogical and seemingly irreconcilable distance between Jews and non-Jews, it envisions God's inclusion of Gentiles as Gentiles, in God's salvation at the culmination of human history. This eschatological transformation restores the Gentiles to the status of pure animals without turning them into Jews. Gentiles become cows, not sheep. Thiessen surveys Mark, Luke, the author of the animal apocalypse, and other Jewish authors who use animal imagery and says, Each of these authors uses impure animal imagery of Gentiles even as they are convinced that Israel's God is in the process of including Gentiles in the eschatological restoration. Gentiles are caught up in God's salvation, but they are caught up in it as Gentiles, not as Jews. This is what the animal imagery in these various Jewish writers suggest. An unchangeable, ontological distinction between Jews and Gentiles that strikes us modern readers as exclusivistic, when it should actually strike us as both exclusivistic and inclusivistic. Difference is acknowledged as real, persistent, and even divinely ordained. Yet, Israel's God includes both Jews and Gentiles in his eschatological restoration, and therefore affirms and eternalizes the ethnic differentiation between Jews and Gentiles. With this Jewish context in mind, let's return to Mark 7, verse 27. Jesus tells the Gentile woman, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. When Jesus calls this woman a dog, he's using animal imagery, as other Jewish authors do, to emphasize that his current priority is to minister to Israel. As New Testament scholar Dr. Daryl Bach points out, the Greek word proton, translated as first, points to priority, not exclusion. This is similar to how Paul uses the term in Romans 1.16, where he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, proton, and also to the Greek. That Jesus prioritizes ministering to Jews over Gentiles during this time is understandable given the Tanakh's presentation of salvation. Messianic Jewish scholar Dr. Stuart Dowerman summarizes the relevance Isaiah 52 has in addressing Israel's priority in God's salvation. He says, Five times the chapter proclaims that this gospel of the coming Redeemer is good news for Jerusalem, and five more times that it is good news for Zion. Verse 7 summarizes this thrust. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. It is only because it is good news for the Jew first that the gospel can by extension be good news for the Gentiles. Certainly many, if not most, first century religious Jews knew that salvation begins with the household of Israel before going out to the nations. Of course it is to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. How could it be otherwise? Isaiah is not alone in this conviction. That is why we read in Acts 15 of James finding the words of Amos a justification of Paul's mission to the pagan world. By the way, pretty soon we'll have a video on the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 responding to the Hebrew Roots' incorrect claim that Gentiles are to become fully Torah observant. So be sure to subscribe so you can be notified when that video comes out. 
Okay, so there's another text in Isaiah that is key. Isaiah 49 verse 6. Here God tells his servant, It is insufficient that you be a servant for me only to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the ruins of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations so that my salvation may extend to the ends of the earth. Notice salvation begins with Israel and spreads to the Gentiles. So going back to Mark, Jesus is carrying out this plan of salvation. He first needs to reach Israel, his covenant people, and then God's salvation will be carried out to the Gentiles. For more on to the Jew first idea, I encourage you to read Dr. David Rudolph's article, To the Jew First, Paul's Vision for the Priority of Israel in the Life of the Church. I'll link that in the description below. Brandon fails to read Mark 7 verse 24 through 30 in its Jewish context, and consequently, he misinterprets the text. When Jesus calls the Gentile woman a dog, he's not using a racial slur. Instead, he's using animal imagery, just like God, the prophets, and other Second Temple Jews, to emphasize how significant it would be to heal this Gentile woman's daughter. Healing her is in no way an instance of Jesus repenting of his racism. This text has nothing to do with racism. Let's return to Brandon's clarification of his interpretation that I played earlier. There is this idea of a kind of corporate repentance, repenting for the sins of my people. And I kind of see it as Jesus, obviously, as you said, being a product of a racist culture and is in this moment learning and repenting for what he's inherited. Brandon is saying this in discussion with Dr. Miguel de la Torre, professor of social ethics and Latinx at the same school where Brandon received his master's degree. And in this discussion, de la Torre pretty much says the same thing as Brandon. Jesus, in order of Jesus's humanity, had to learn how to be human. And I think what I'm suggesting is that part of that learning is learning how not to be racist. Because racism is not an individual bias sin. It is a corporate, institutionalized uh, sin that we live into because this is what our culture teaches us. And Jesus, being rooted in his own culture, had to learn how not to imitate the racism of his culture. Brandon and De La Torre are claiming that Jesus inherited his racism from the Jewish community. And in Mark 7, he is repenting for the racism of his people. They're defending a particular sermon that De La Torre gave called, Was Jesus a Racist? And I think this sermon provides some background to Brandon's TikTok on this topic. Here's a clip from the sermon. Now at the time, Jews did not associate with the Canaanites. The Canaanites were the other. The Canaanites were those people of color that, that, that if you touch, you become unpure. So the Canaanites were the marginalized of the time of Jesus. And it's interesting that for Jesus at the time, salvation was only for the Jews. In Matthew 10, 5, Jesus' first missionary instructions were, to go out only to the Jewish nation. Now, was Jesus a racist? So he begins his ministry in chapter 15, 24, by saying, do not turn your steps to pagan territory and do not enter any Samaritan town. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Salvation was not for them color folks who are the Canaanites. But then Jesus meets a woman of color who challenges Jesus. And he begins by telling her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not I was first sent to them, or I'll get to you later, but I was only sent to them. So, so quite frankly, all these other people were not included in this salvation plan until he learned from this woman of color. And here is the good news. Jesus, in all of his humanity, was willing to learn from a woman of color. 
I already addressed why Jesus' prioritizing of Jewish people during his ministry does not exclude Gentiles from salvation. But De La Torre goes even further and claims that salvation was for Jews and not, in his words, them color folks who were the Canaanites. He says that Jesus learned from a woman of color. In the video with Brandon where he defends his sermon, he claims that Jews as a people were racist. So by repeatedly emphasizing that the Canaanites were people of color, in contrast to the Jews, throughout his sermon, De La Torre strongly implies that first century Jews, including Jesus himself, were white racists. This is not just historically erroneous. This fuels anti-Semitism. So let me address his claims. First, many Jews today living in North America and Europe have white skin, myself included. And the reason this is the case is because throughout our history, we have undergone multiple periods of displacement from Israel, our indigenous ancestral homeland. However, Jesus and his Jewish community did not have white skin. Dr. Joanne Taylor, a historian of Second Temple Judaism, in her book, What Did Jesus Look Like?, says this, There is a reason why no one particularly commented on the color of Jesus' eyes or hair or skin. His were the same as just about everyone else's in the region. Brown eyes, olive brown skin, black hair. Taylor says that Jesus' skin coloration would have looked similar to this image of a first century mummy portrait of Artemodorus. Notice Artemodorus is not white. He has olive brown skin. Taylor also writes, I think the closest correspondence to what Jesus really looked like is found in the depiction of Moses on the walls of the 3rd century synagogue of Dura Europus, since it shows how a Jewish sage was imagined in the Greco-Roman world. And again, notice that in this depiction of Moses, he is not white, he has olive brown skin. Jesus and the rest of the Jewish community living in Israel had pretty much the same skin color as the Canaanites. Now let me quote someone that De La Torre should agree with. In the book Decolonizing Christianity, the author says this, Most of those who insist they are followers of the dark-skinned Middle Eastern Jewish rabbi called Yeshua voted for a person who promised to make America great again by throwing this dark-skinned Yeshua foreigner into a migrant camp. Miguel de la Torre is the one who wrote this. In his sermon, de la Torre strongly implies that Jesus was white. But here in his book, Jesus is a dark-skinned, Middle Eastern Jewish rabbi called by his Hebrew name Yeshua. To me, it seems that de la Torre is painting the color of Jesus' skin to whatever way suits the political point he's trying to make. A second point I want to address is De La Torre's claim that prior to Matthew 15, Jesus excluded Gentiles from God's plan of salvation. Salvation was not for them color folks who are the Canaanites. But then Jesus meets a woman of color who challenges Jesus. And he begins by telling her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not, I was first sent to them, or I'll get to you later, but I was only sent to them. So, so quite frankly, all these other people were not included in the salvation plan until he learned from this woman of color. This is just wrong. In Matthew 12, just three chapters before Matthew 15, Jesus responds to Pharisees and scribes asking him to provide a sign to prove that he is the Messiah. Jesus says, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. I'll have a future video addressing this text in depth, assessing the Jewishness of the Messianic belief in Jesus' death and resurrection. But what I want to highlight right now is that part of the sign of the prophet Jonah is Jesus' resurrection as indicated by verse 40. But it's also the repentance of the Gentiles as indicated by verse 41. In the book of Jonah, there are two miracles, not one. First, Jonah is delivered from the fish. Second, the people of Nineveh repent and turn to the God of Israel. Jesus claims that his messianic sign will be a close parallel. As Jonah was delivered from the great fish, Jesus will rise from the dead. 
As the Ninevites repented, so will the Gentiles, which, as I discussed earlier, Isaiah predicted. New Testament scholar Dr. Brant Petrie says this, According to Jesus, it is not just his resurrection from the dead that will be a reason for believing in him. It is also the inexplicable conversion of the pagan nations of the world, the Gentiles. Jesus already had the salvation of the Gentiles in mind even before he met with the Gentile woman in Matthew 15. Yes, Jesus came to save the Jewish people, but this was also so that salvation may extend to the ends of the earth, as it says in Isaiah 49 verse 6. Let's return to Miguel de la Torre's and Brandon's claim that Jesus' Jewish community was racist. First, Jesus calling the Gentile woman a dog in Mark chapter 7 and Matthew 15 is not a racial slur. Therefore, it is not evidence that Jews as a people were racist. Second, while many Jews condemn pagan idolatry, this does not amount to racism. As I discussed earlier, Jewish people had roughly the same skin color as their Gentile neighbors. Jews lived in the same cities as Gentiles throughout the Roman Empire, and the Jewish historian Josephus quotes the pagan geographer Strabo, saying, This people, speaking of the Jews, has made its way into every city, and it is not easy to find any place in the habitable world which has not received them. Historian Dr. Paula Fredrickson points out that in the epigraphy and literary sources, Jews turn up in theaters, hippodromes, and odeons, all cities of cultic as well as, or rather, at the same time as cultural activity. Jews watched performances and acted in them. We also have evidence of Jewish gladiators. This is a more complicated issue, but essentially, in these diaspora cities, there were Jewish quarters, and in Israel, there were Jewish and Gentile areas. They were separatists, but it would be wrong to claim that their separatism was motivated by racism. Keep in mind that in the 2nd century BCE, Jewish people received intense persecution under the Seleucid king Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He outlawed Jewish practice under penalty of gruesome execution. In the first century CE, Jews were allowed to practice their faith without fear of punishment, but they were still a minority group in a predominantly pagan world. Their separatism was a way of retaining their Jewish identity. New Testament scholar Dr. E.P. Sanders says this, Things look different if one thinks of minority groups that are trying to maintain their own identity. I have never felt that the strict Amish are iniquitous, and I do not think that in assessing Jewish separatism in the diaspora, we are dealing with a moral issue. In the first century, Jewish people remained faithful to the God of Israel by not sacrificing to pagan deities or consuming unkosher food. But this did not necessarily stop them from engaging with Gentiles and even sharing meals with them. For example, in the letter of Aristius, which was written around 200 BCE or half a century or so later, it describes the Jews who translated the Tanakh into Greek eating with the king of Egypt for seven days. The author narrates the king informing his Jewish guests, Everything shall be prepared in keeping with your usages, for me also along with you. Whenever guests visited the reigning king, preparations were made according to their usages, so that there should be nothing to discomfort them, and they could pass the time in good cheer. Sanders points out that Jewish texts such as Daniel 1 verse 3 through 17, 2 Maccabees 7 verse 1 through 2, 3 Maccabees 3 verse 4 and 7, Esther 4 17 from the Septuagint, and Tobit 1 verse 11, all of these have at least the implied paranetic purpose of advising Jews of what to do when in Gentile lands or at Gentile tables. Avoid the meat and wine and preferably bring your own food. Jubilees 22 verse 16 does forbid Jews from eating with Gentiles, but this is an exception and does not represent the practice most Jews would accept. Commenting on the letter of Aristius, Sanders writes, Monotheism is what led to separatism. It was to prevent corruption of worship that Moses hedged us in on all sides, with strict observances connected with meat and drink and touch and hearing and sight, after the manner of the law. The Jews are forbidden to harm anyone in thought or in deed. Their responsibility is to live among others as wise and prudent companions who help them to rise above ignorance and achieve progress in life. From the Gentile side, Celsus, a 2nd century CE pagan philosopher, writes this, Jews observe a worship which may be very peculiar, but it is at least traditional. In this respect, they behave like the rest of humankind, because every ethnos honors traditions of its fathers. 
Many Jews were separatists, but keep in mind that separatism does not mean exclusion. Yes, there were separate neighborhoods for Jews, but they welcomed Gentiles to worship with them in their synagogues. Scholars call these Gentiles God-fears. They took on some Jewish practice and participated in the synagogue without becoming a Jew. Many of these Gentiles continued to engage in their pagan practices that were forbidden to Jews, but they still were welcome to participate in the synagogue. Luke discusses God-fears in the book of Acts. For example, in Acts chapter 13, verse 14 through 16, it says this, And on the Sabbath day, Paul and his companions went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Paul addresses the Jews in the synagogue as men of Israel, and the Gentiles present as you who fear God. Concerning Cornelius, who was a God-fearer, Luke describes him as a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. The men who invite Peter into Cornelius' home tell Peter that Cornelius is an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation. Josephus and other ancient writers also discuss God-fears, and as Jewish scholar Dr. Shea J.D. Cohen says, they frequented the synagogues of the Jews, much as they would the temples or ceremonies of other foreign gods. They befriended Jews, much as they would other ethnic groups. This is all to say that separatism does not mean exclusion. To conclude, Brandon Robertson and Miguel de la Torre are wrong on multiple fronts. When Jesus calls the woman a dog, he's not using a racial slur. Jesus was not a racist, and nowhere does Jesus repent of his racism. Jesus uses animal imagery, just like God, the prophets, and other Second Temple Jews, to emphasize how significant it would be to heal this Gentile woman's daughter. Brandon and De La Torre are dramatically incorrect to claim that Jews as a people were racist. And De La Torre is certainly wrong to strongly imply that Jesus and the Jewish community he was a part of were white racists in particular. I'm not claiming these guys are anti-Semitic, but their teaching fuels anti-Semitism, which is extremely harmful, and it's unfortunately on the rise today. I'm convinced that when you read the New Testament in its Jewish context, you will understand it better and avoid being tangled up by these kinds of uninformed assertions that result in anti-Semitism. If you learned something new, consider giving this video a like and subscribing to the YouTube channel and podcast. If you like, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts because this really helps people discover our content. And as always, if you would like to share your thoughts on anything I've said, please leave a comment below and send us an email at 2 messianicjews at gmail.com. That's 2-T-W-O, messianicjews at gmail.com. Thanks for watching and see you next time.